Hi, Stefan. Thanks for being with us. Well, thanks for inviting me. Well, you're you're all the way over in Sweden, and I appreciate you taking the time uh, in your on your busy evenings with your daughter to be with us here today or tonight for you. Um, we're just going to cut to the chase with um, our talk. Um, there's still a lot of uh, debate as to whether climate change is real or um, if we can do anything about it or if, if we're actually responsible, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So. Um, you being an expert in sustainability and an economist and have done work for the UN on this very topic, I thought you'd be the perf perfect person to talk about this. And so thank you so much for being here. Um, so let's just, let's go to it. Is, so is climate change real? Um, it's a strange question to me because um, cli the climate has always changed. Um, the world is not thinkable without climate change. We have had uh, the cold periods and the interglacials, the warm periods. Uh, there's always been change in the in the in the Earth's climate. So uh, the very question whether climate change is for real or not it would disqualify a lot of people if they if that question was really asked, because uh, that is one thing we know for very certain that over geological time frames. The Earth has always had a changing climate. What's new is only one thing, and that's the speed at which the climate is changing. And that is depending on uh, so-called greenhouse gases that um, are emitted uh, mostly from fossil fuels, uh, the burning of fossil fuels. And um, that has uh, triggered uh, quite a rapid change in comparison to uh, historical um, time frames. Um, as to how fast the global climate is changing now. So what, what has been happening in terms of uh, 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 the change that we're experiencing? How, how bad is it? Well, we know that it's uh, too fast for quite a number of species to cope with. Um, I think uh, in, in many tourism sectors, you already see changes that are to the detriment of those subsectors. Skiing is very often mentioned. We know that it's getting too warm in, in many areas to continue ski operations, and that's one of the concerns sectors, if you want to, uh, where we know that climate change will actually have an impact. So um, I think it's time for tourism actors to uh, uh, discover this problem and to take it for, for, for a serious issue that we have to deal with. So in, in terms of, um, in, in terms of uh, emitters or, or problematic countries, who, who tend to be the ones at the top of the list? I think it's probably only to some extent a question of countries uh, at this point. Um, the whole debate about mitigation and cutting emissions started uh, back in the 90s, as you might know, and uh, we had in 1997 the Kyoto Protocol uh, that asked certain countries that were high emitters uh, to cut down on, on, on uh, emissions. But the level of emissions from which they should cut down is actually based on average per capita per year emissions. So what people were looking at, the scientists uh, making those, or not the scientists, the politicians making those treaties, they were looking at the average amount of emissions from a citizen in, say, country A or B or C, and then on, based on that they made decisions as to how much these countries should cut back on their emissions. It's a global approach, it's based on global justice, and it's based on the notion that many countries in the world are low emitters actually at this point and that they should have a right to further grow in emissions in comparison to other countries. So that is the historical understanding of uh, the problem. I think at this point we should uh, think differently um, because we know that, for instance, in many developing countries, we also have high emitters um, within the population. It's very often very skewed. Um, how much individuals contribute to the problem. And I think that um, we probably have some kind of Pareto um, uh, distribution, uh, which means that there must be some kind of 20% of the world's population accounting for 80% of the, of the emissions. But if you go within these 20%, uh, then probably that another 20% that again accounts for 80% of those emissions. So we, I think we have to look at the high emitters and not just at the um, 
high emitters in high emitting countries. Ah, okay. So, so in terms of so so why why do we keep circling the drain? We have all of these these uh, conferences on climate change. We've got another one that's coming up. That's a big treaty that's supposed to be signed. We keep circling the drain. Nothing seems to get done. What what is going on? Why are we not getting uh, people to to sign on or buy in? What's going on? Well, there's just a personal uh, stand on this here, but I think you know, most people are afraid that uh, high energy costs, which would be needed to cut down on emissions, uh, would be a, to a detriment to the economy, to economic growth, and that's something we're all concerned about all the time, of course. I personally think that's wrong for two reasons. First of all, um, we know that we are wasting a lot of energy and um, I, whenever I stay in a hotel, I'm just shaking my head because with very simple measures, I could uh, probably carve out a, an annual income from uh, that hotel in terms of possible savings that would be really low cost. And um, then secondly, um, I think um, if energy becomes expensive, it, it really triggers innovation. And we need innovation, and you can see that in um, in the UK, for instance, where it's a law that uh, the country has to decline in emissions by I think 80 percent by 2050. And uh, since that is a law, there's also monitoring uh, process in place, and that helps to actually bring all sorts of innovation forward. And very often, it's connected to uh, gains in uh, quality of life. Um, so a lot of things that we at first sight would believe are negative, uh, that, that would impact us in a negative way. Actually, they might turn out to be uh, quite interesting triggers to a different lifestyle, to a, uh, a different practice uh, that, after all, becomes something that actually increases our quality of life. So it, we're, we're the, this whole study of sustainability, which is not really trickling down into business yet, and this is one of my goals, is to get the work that you and your colleagues do, like Brian Garrett and Carl Cater and many more, um, to get the work that you guys do and bring it to people who really need to understand that um, what what you're doing is bringing them a new model for, for a business that will actually help them. It'll actually create a better bottle, bottom line, better lifestyle, um, attract better workers. I mean, there's, I, I mean, I've been reading your books and many others and, and it's really, I don't understand why it hasn't caught on yet, but I think we're so entrenched in this, this, this other business model that is no longer working and we don't know how to extricate ourselves. We're afraid to step into something new. And, and, and now you're discovering after doing this work for how many years? Like you've been doing this for like 15 years, maybe longer. You've been in this 20 years. Um, you're, you're actually seeing that um, companies are, uh, really benefiting from following the, the sustainability model and putting their businesses through the frameworks that save money right off the top. So can, can you give us some um, examples of companies possibly in the dive industry even, but maybe just hotel chains or you know, people that we would recognize that, are, that have put their, their businesses through and are coming out uh, winners? Uh, there's probably more examples that I even could even recount here, um, but a lot of work has been done actually in this direction. So um, whoever decides to take a step in that direction is definitely not going to be the first. Um, I think energy, unfortunately, for some reason, is something that we've always taken for granted. We've never been thinking about energy. It's just been there. It's been a very tiny fraction of our um, of our operational costs. And I think that is changing now. Um, if you look into aviation, for instance, in 2007, nobody had any idea about the price hike that was coming in 2008, when all of a sudden the price of a barrel of um, A1 um, went from $87 to 147 within just a year. Nobody had foreseen it. That's a huge vulnerability. And uh, I think airlines by now have 28% uh, of their operational cost is uh, actually fossil fuels. So if you consider that, even though for hotels it might be a lot less, just 6% perhaps on average, um, I think there is a strong business case really for 
um, for considering um, the cost of energy. And uh, it's, it's not really sexy, I think, uh, which might be another reason why many people don't talk about it or think about it. But uh, once you engage in some kind of carbon audit or some kind of energy assessment, uh, people very often start to better understand their business and what's it, what it's based on. And just that insight very often, in my uh, opinion, my experience is something that people really appreciate. I've been working with uh, hoteliers through the bottom basements of their, of their hotels and they were saying, oh, I've never been here. And then they saw dripping pipes and uh, old machinery and um, got pretty scared and uh, decided that perhaps it was time for innovation. And very often that innovation is paying off. So not only do you better understand the business that you're running, um, there's also a lot of money that's actually to be made in the first stages, uh, anyway, of, of such a restructuring process. So mm -hmm. in all my experience, I've always encountered two things. The first is some resistance to deal with these issues, and the second, it's, um, it's, it's a real um, understanding that there's money to be made and that it's uh, actually a benefit once you do step over this uh, barrier and actually face um, energy issues. And, it, and of course, it's not just uh, carbon uh, emissions that you're looking at. You're looking at um, how we're wasting water and, and how we're not building efficiently and um, uh, overbuilding and not really having a plan for waste management and, and all these other things that we've all taken for granted up till now. Um, but yeah. that's, what your, that's what your book was, all, your, well, this amazing paper that I've read uh, about talking about um, assessing tourism's global environmental impact, it's uh, really you're, you are showing how tourism is expanding at a phenomenal rate, um, and yet our resources are just starting to plummet. And at some point, we're going to butt up, and we're and we're going to hit um, this point where prices are going to go up, supply is going to go down. Um, and uh, people are going to get, start to have difficulty doing business. But when that happens, um, innovation is going to start to really happen. And that's what happened with the aviation industry. Um, now they're starting to do biofuel testing and all that kind of stuff. And you're seeing it in resorts, starting to see that um, when, they, when, when, they're, when they're having uh, to step into a, a more sustainable business model, uh, they're starting to create, they're having these innovations that are coming out of this that are hugely beneficial that actually everybody can benefit from. And so it's not all doom and gloom. It's actually um, uh, what your work is doing and all the people that um, have put their business through this are actually giving us hope that sustainable business models do work and that it's going to help our climate, it's going to help our environment it's, it's going to um, help our bottom lines. And, and this, this keeps coming up, and I want you to address this. It's too expensive for me to do the sustainable business model. Can you please speak to that? Well, to me, expensive is not to think about these issues. That's the really expensive part. Um, but uh, why wouldn't you? Um, 30 years ago, dealing with the environment was really something that was about altruistic motives. It was about, you know, the weird guys, um, the, late, the last hippies, if you want. But um, what has fundamentally changed is that the environment is now a mainstream issue and it's an issue of quality. So if you can say that you're doing something about the environment, uh, about preserving resources, you'll actually... Um, open up a door to your clients that they will really be thankful about. Um, because everybody is expecting these days that business businesses act. Um, tourists don't want to you know, do a lot of things themselves. They want businesses to act responsibly and to enjoy a product, a service that they know is sustainable. So mm -hmm. I think um, that is another argument that is very important, that there's an expectation out there and that expectation is not going to vanish. It's going to be stronger and stronger. 
So add that to the fact that uh, wasting resources is just expensive. You have to very sound, very good arguments to actually engage in um, uh, saving resources and saving energy. And very often you can even turn that into something that becomes more special. We've been working in resort hotels, for instance, that had huge buffets with, with food and a lot of that was spaced afterwards. And a lot of that food obviously had to be low quality because they had to purchase huge, huge volumes. Now, I changed that in one hotel towards a smaller buffet. They work with regional products. They, you know, can prepare more special food dishes that are coming from the region that are traditional. It costs a lot less. It's not sourced from the global market. It's coming from local farmers. You can turn all of that into a very good argument um, that is actually a, a big benefit for guests. They, because what, what are they talking about? Most resort hotels in one way or the other are quite similar. So if, if you can be outstanding in terms of the food you're using and offering, then um, that is actually something people would take back with them and that becomes your, uh, you know, your um, selling point that is quite unique. And um, there's many things like that that we can do that um, requires some effort, but by the end of the day, we save both money and we build relationships with our customers that are long lasting. And in these times when people just choose destinations on ever faster basis uh, through global channels that compete on price, I would say that's very important to put some effort into that. So you you are, are finding, um, I'm finding, uh, just just in my experience that people are more interested in choosing um, hotels and dive operators and liveaboards and that kind of thing who are who are um, making headway being more sustainable and are more concerned about the environment it's not just about marine conservation it's about how they do business how they run their businesses and and are you seeing this that um, on a broader level in tourism that more and more people are voting with their dollars and they are 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 specifically going out and and choosing those people who are 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 being are being um, they're not nobody sustainable but going on the sustainable pathway. Um, I wouldn't say there's a a large huge share of people who are willing to pay a lot extra for. Uh, more environmentally friendly practices or um, uh, services. But what I do think is that if there is a choice between two businesses that are more or less uh, similar, uh, offer the same product, then people would definitely go for the one that is um, um, more environmentally friendly, more environmentally concerned, more sustainable. It's, it's a question of quality. If you know you know, the eggs in the morning are coming from some local farmer or they are coming by with a big ship from some anonymous, uh, huge uh, cage-based uh, kind of production center. Well, would you really think twice about what you want for breakfast? And I think uh, people are waking to the fact that food is not food, that there's huge differences. And this is the same with dive operators, with hotels, with everything. People are becoming aware and they want the better product, and the better product is the one that is sustainable. That is very clear, I think. So it's it's a matter of uh, educating your consumers that this is, or your customers coming to your your establishment that you are doing this, and just so that they know that you're doing this, you're you're making the extra step. And so when that tourist goes to another place and they're not doing that, they'll go, oh well, at the other place we did that, they did this, and you're not doing that. And I, I imagine this is going, it's just only going to increase um, the kind of pressure on those establishments that are not uh, really walking on the sustainable pathway. They're, they're going to have to just, just because people around them are doing it, they're going to have to pull up their socks and, and, and do it just to be competitive. Uh, I think it's just a question of time until TripAdvisor and others will in introduce uh, a green criterion in, in their list of criteria that you can judge. At the moment, it's staff friendliness, it's price, it's location, but uh, given another two years, they will have something so like sustainability that people can rate, and that will make a huge change because all of a sudden you can see how well a business is performing. And when that comes, I think most people will awake 
to the fact that there's differences. And then those who are the leaders in the field, they will benefit from this kind of development. And the rest will fall away eventually because they're just not, they're not in the game anymore. And there's always a, you can always compete on, diff, on, on other things, but uh, why would you want to run that risk? I mean, uh, as I said from, from the start, uh, it's about, ultimately it's about economics. You, you can really save money on this. That I've never seen a single case of, of a business that hasn't saved money on dealing with, with energy questions. So take that as a starting point, improve your basis for the future that may come and then uh, you're probably in a very good position to actually attract more consumers in the future, more guests than, than before at a lower cost with a higher quality standard. So if you, if you were to uh, advise somebody in the dive industry, say a dive operator or a resort or whatever, where would you advise they start? Uh, if they're going to, if, how, where would you, if they, they've got a lot going on. Where would they start in their operation? Let's say it's, um, let's look at a, uh, um, a dedicated dive resort. So it's got boats and it's, it's got restaurants and it's got accommodation. Um, where would you suggest that they start um, to look at their, their uh, property and, and how to improve it and get it on, on a, a sustainable course? Well, there's obviously a huge variation in, in, in that industry. There's um, uh, small island resorts, there's uh, resorts in big countries. The, the infrastructure that is there and the environment of the situation may be fundamentally different. But what people could try to do um, is to perhaps try to source green uh, electricity, electricity that is coming from wind power, from solar power. They might try to build their own solar panels very often feasible, most of the time economical as well. Um, and uh, as for, for buffets, I mean, if you talk about diving about the sea, uh, you can try to avoid species that are threatened, that are red listed, that are, you know, on the don't eat lists, um, and to try to find alternatives that, that are equally tasty and that guests may appreciate. And I think Sometimes you might even win by standing out and saying, we're not doing something. We are not using, you know, giant prawns anymore because we know they are connected to um, shortcutting of mangrove uh, forests in, in, in many uh, tropical developing countries. Um, and you, you are not silent about that. You, just, you don't just take away that product from the buffet. You tell people about it, you know. You, you, you tell them, we're not doing that because it's not good for the environment and we want to preserve the oceans and as an alternative we offer you this and that and people will love it they will not say oh that's a bad idea or i haven't had the same experience as before they will love it they will definitely you know adore you for that kind of initiative so so part of our job as as in the dive business is to uh 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 for lack of a better word, educate our, our, our customers on why we are doing things the way we're doing them so that they'll go, oh, right, I get it. I never thought of that before. Uh, and then they, they will go off and it'll create this tremendous ripple effect, which we're already starting to see, I think anyway, um, uh, that people are now becoming more aware, as you say, of um, you know why is this destination that has sun 350 days of the year? Why are they not on solar power? It makes no sense. Or why is this destination that has um, a problem because there are no NASA groupers on their reefs? Why are they importing grouper from other parts of the Caribbean when it seems that there's they're endangered? Or you know all of these kinds of they're going to start to question these things. But it, they won't start to question them until um, we in the dive industry who are doing business on a daily basis explain why we're doing the things we're doing. And, and in doing so, that helps customers to um, embrace new ideas and then start questioning the other places that they go to. And, and I, I see that certainly. Um, uh, the one thing that I do notice, though, is that the people who are doing a great job are really not blowing their own horn. Um, yeah, that is um, strange. I think, to me, diving has always been about education. It's about deep experiences. Uh, it's about understanding uh, a different environment. So, I mean, the dive industry is really one area where a lot more communication about these issues 
could take place because people are open for it. Um, they would like to hear these stories. They are very often in doubt. They have heard different stories from different sides. Um, I mean, most dive operators I've been talking to, they've seen changes in their marine environments. It's nothing that's abstract or in the future. They do see these changes. And even though you can never say, in this case, it's related to climate change or not, um, I think we can say that the trend is that these changes are related to climate change one way or the other. So I think we should talk about it. Um, I really want people to talk about it. I want them to be proud about the work they are doing. Um, I want this to become a self-reinforcing process where people you know, become aware of these issues, take them with them. And I want, I want the divers to ask critical questions as well. If you all, as tourists, ask just one critical question each time we go on holiday, it would change the world because all of a sudden people would have to start thinking about it. They would have to make a difference. And um, that would be a very, very good process if that could be initiated by the dive industry. I, I am with you on that. I forgot to mention um, that you are a diver and you started writing some amazing reports on the dive industry and ma marine tourism. That's how I first came across you a few years ago. And uh, if anybody knows about this, it's you about how the dive business works, how the dive industry uh, fits into the broader uh, scheme of things. And, um, and what you're saying is we truly are in the perfect position to be ocean ambassadors and be powerful tools for change, powerful voices for change and, and getting our customers on board and telling them, you know, how important their choices are. We've, we've made our choices to protect the environment and so then now they can go out with their choices and put their money where their mouths are and, and choose things that are environmentally friendly and ask those critical questions. And, it, and, and it, we could uh, turn things around faster than anything because divers are, are everywhere. Which brings me to another point. Okay, I've been reading your, 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 your book and your reports and one of the, thing, one of the things that came up for me was uh, how much carbon emissions there are for long haul vacations involving uh, well, long haul for the aviation aspect of it because uh, air airlines throw a tremendous amount of, of um, greenhouse gases into the uh, atmosphere. But then they go on some kind of a cruise ship. And can we cl include liveaboards in that? Like how much, how much does a liveaboard throw up into the air in terms of, you know, per capita greenhouse gas? Do you have any, I know it's really hard to get these kinds of details you have you have details on cruise ships, but that kind of that relationship of long haul and and live aboard uh, came up for me, and this is this is a big trend in our industry is people are going farther and farther afield to get to the more pristine conditions, and and this uh, this is a concern for our industry obviously because we're throwing up a lot of greenhouse gases, but what do liveaboards do? Like, what, are there any innovations happening that can help liveaboards to uh, reduce their impact? Um, I would think uh, in some areas you might be able to buy biofuel um, rather than diesel uh, for your engines. Um, the more tangible thing is probably to look into the size of your engines because we, we know diving is about machuism, um, it's, it's about big engines, it's about speed, it's about huge um, outboarders. Um, we may have to look into that and try to, you know, step down a little bit, not to overpower those boats uh, as we often do and uh, try perhaps to go at lower speeds. Um, on the other hand, in comparison to, uh, to emissions from flying to the destination and back, um, it's probably that would probably dwarf emissions from from the boats so uh, um, we have to be realistic about how much that is in comparison what we really want to do is that people uh, stay longer in the destinations when they go on long-haul flights so that the destination can really maximize the benefits the current trend is the opposite we go to more destinations that are further away for shorter periods of time and we need to reverse that somehow um, so if there's anything you can offer, 
uh, two guests, another dive, uh, another day you can add with uh, you know some some good product that people would enjoy and that would make them stay longer. That's always mm. something that's very very good uh, to mm. to get down emissions on a per capita basis, uh, on a per capita per day basis. So um, one of the things that is uh, keeps popping up and I can't get a clear answer on it, and and I, maybe there is no clear answer. But it's all the the issue of carbon offsets, and and I know some carbon offset programs. A carbon offset offset, first of all, is something that you can purchase when you um, go on an uh, on a on a flight to help offset the emissions that you create by taking that flight. But I understand that these carbon offset programs, some of them are just basically a shell game. They don't actually offset anything. Um, it's a way for that particular company to make extra money. Um, are there any carbon offset programs that you know of that are are working that actually are um, helping to balance out climate change? Well, I wouldn't want to recommend anyone because there's several that are doing a good job and many really try hard. Um, my personal stance on carbon offsets is that um, it's an imperfect system because there's so many options, so many different things you can do in an open trading environment. Essentially, we could, you know, uh, offset a lot of uh, emissions by exchanging, say, a, a coal-fired power station somewhere in Asia, and then um, they just build another one, and that doesn't make sense at all. However, um, I'm personally offsetting um, all my emissions. Uh, I've even done that historically, so to look back in time, uh, it's still quite cheap. It will be more expensive in the future, so go for it now is my advice. Um, it's not really expensive to offset. Uh, uh, um, a solid, valid, credible offset is about $23, $25 uh, per ton of carbon dioxide that you're offsetting. And uh, if you try to find someone who's offering, um, well, now it comes a term that's a bit different, GSCERs, uh, Gold Standard um, Certified Emission Reductions, which is okay. nothing, you can ask for that. What you want is offsets that are registered with the United Nations, so mm -hmm. that there is an off official body controlling these. And you want the, go you want the gold standard, uh, but not the voluntary gold standard, you want the real gold standard because it ensures that there is some sustainable development benefits involved in the projects that they do. And uh, they, if, if you ask for that, um, there is offsetters, um, just try to find a list on the internet who is ranked highest, uh, you will find certain ones, I'm sure, that offer this kind of standard. And um, it's not much money in comparison to what you actually achieve. And uh, I think it's a very good way of, you know, uh, in this case, compensating your contribution to climate change, even though, of course, the system has to improve and, uh, and so on. But I do it because I believe in it. I think it's a way. It's a step in the right direction. Yeah, it's a step in the, in the right direction. All the excuses I've heard from people not doing it, well, to me, it appears that those people really try to find an excuse. It's not really about questioning what's there in the market. It's uh, rather a way of, you know, ignoring the issues. But um, yeah. I think it's a good enough way to um, to actually focus on this. Yes. Well, this is this has been hugely helpful. Um, I I so appreciate you just being there and being the voice coming from a diving perspective you are a diver you know what this is all about and to be able to address the the diving community um, is uh, huge uh, for us and thank you so much for doing this is there any um, final thing you'd like to give us um, to give us some inspiration or some focus or some direction. One of the things you said was if every tourist asks some, just one question of an operator, um, that would help to change the world. Um, what could we do as businesses? Uh, what one question could we ask ourselves? Well, you, we can discuss with each other. I believe in cooperation. I believe in you know, in um, alive oceans that are full with species that we would love to see. Um, I believe there's opportunities to achieve this. I believe uh, uh, there's no cost involved, just benefits. Um, 
I well, I, I think there's so many things we do we can do if you only want to do them. And uh, I would encourage everyone to to be proud about what we are, part of this great system that we can change and influence and um, also perhaps to reflect on what's at stake. Um, it's it's a beautiful, beautiful system that we want to preserve for future generations. And I think everybody is aware of the fact that that is really needed and uh, we can do it together. We just have to, you know, have one vision and um, perhaps fight for it, but uh, it's doable. It's doable. Yes, <laughs> it's doable. I like to hear this. This is wonderful. Well, listen, um, I strongly, for everybody who's watching, I strongly recommend you get Carbon Management and Tourism. It's, it's, it is so well done. Um, it's getting outdated, though. You've got to update it. Yeah, put that on your list, will you? It's, um, it's an excellent book. And um, this Journal for Sustainable Tourism report that um, is based on your UN work, um, uh, that really brought it home for me about how consumptive our industry is as a, as a broader view of the tourism industry and uh, what we can do uh, to get ourselves back on track. Um, and if we don't do it, you know, certainly regulations are going to come into place, um, but we need to start doing it voluntarily because, as you say, there's only benefits. So why are we not doing it? There's only benefits. Uh, so um, thank you for all your hard work. It, it is going to go to very good places and people are going to use this. And uh, again, thank you so, so much. We truly appreciate it. Thanks, Lori. Thanks for your patience with me. Uh, short emails once in a while. <laughs> Just today was a horrible day. It started this morning with one of with a totally different paper that was published and the national media was on me <laughs> early in the morning. So um, I was fighting. but. Um, it's all working in the right direction, I think. Well, you're, you're the kingpin, you know, everybody's coming to you because you have brought together all the skill sets throughout, the, uh, throughout your career and it's come to this point where you are one of the, uh, the key people that's going to help us turn this thing around and it's turning around already just by the work that you've done. It's, it's, uh, right. it's getting Which, out there. That's why the media is after you. It's getting out there. <laughs> well, I wish that was true. But uh, I think there's change. I think people are waking to, to new ideas and they see uh, that not all is doom and that there's different lifestyles possible. And um, yeah, I, I think I see a lot of change that is positive. Mm. Wonderful. Well, listen, thank you again so much for uh, taking this time on your, your, your valuable evenings with your family to be with us. And um, uh, let's stay in touch and see what, how we can uh, help our industry to become real, true ambassadors for the ocean and for um, a better world. Thank you so much. Thanks for your work, Lori. Okay, take You're care. us all together. Yay. Bye-bye. So. Take care. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>